Christina Gugino, and I'm an OCD Massachusetts board member. Welcome to the Les Broadberg Memorial OCD Lecture Series. Tonight, Dr. Lee Bear will be discussing intrusive thoughts. Dr. Lee Bear is a clinical professor of psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and is the co-founder of the OCD Clinic at <coughs> OCD Clinic at Massachusetts General Hospital and the OCD Institute at McLean Hospital. He is an internationally known researcher in OCD and related conditions and the author of several, several books on OCD for the general public. Please join me in welcoming him here tonight. There are two of them in front of the front of people. It's great to be back here. I haven't done one of these talks in probably two years. I think the last time there were tables spread around the room. We had about 10 or 15 people. But it's great to see um, the growth of this uh, series. Uh, can everybody in back here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. A little bit more would be nice. Jeff, if you want to chair the way up the front. Let's see if you can turn the volume up. Is that any better? Yeah. Okay. Let's see if you work in. I'll try to talk louder. Um, I have a cold, so my voice starts to go. I might ask for volunteers to talk. Um, but I'll, I'll try to speak as loudly as I can. So, um, actually, Denise, um, Ian Stack, gave this talk the name Intrusive Thoughts. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more specifically about one particular type of intrusive thought, um, which are taboo obsessions. Uh, before I start, though, I like it better if we're a little bit more informal. So rather than just lecturing and waiting until the end for your questions, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. We can usually answer one or two in between um, the slides and then answer some at the end as well. Um, let me see if this pointer works. Okay, so what kind of thoughts are we going to be talking about? So the newest term for these thoughts are taboo obsessions. Has anybody heard of that term? So when you think of taboo thoughts, what do you think about? Anybody? What does a taboo mean? People don't like to talk about them. Right, people don't like to talk about them. Why don't they like to talk about them? <laughs> Inappropriate? Yeah. Right. So people don't like to talk about them because they uh, um, are socially inappropriate or embarrassing thoughts. And the main type of thoughts are violent obsessions. These are thoughts or images about hurting someone. Um, I think you all know the different future obsessions and compulsions that I'll review quickly. So the obsessions are the thoughts or images that come into your mind against your will. So in this case, it might be an image of stabbing a baby or dropping a baby. Uh, it might be a thought about how terrible that might be. The ritual in that case might be to hide knives or stay away from babies. What we're going to talk tonight about is the obsessions themselves, which you usually don't talk about. Uh, then there are sexual obsessions and blasphemous obsessions. And, and the blasphemous obsessions um, really depend more on a person's particular religion. So why are certain things taboo? So there are certain topics that uh, there are taboos in, in just about all the world's religions. All the world's religions say, you know, do not kill, um, don't um, blaspheme God in, in various terms, don't um, have inappropriate sexual thoughts. So the idea here is that thoughts are taboo because a particular culture or group says you should have those thoughts. And it could be um, just the general population. So for example, in most societies in the world, world pedophilia is um, a taboo. Um, or it could be a particular taboo. So for example, uh, eating non-kosher foods uh, for an Orthodox Jew or thinking bad thoughts about her and her Okay, so why these particular obsessions? Why do people get these kind of thoughts rather than other thoughts? So this is a book I wrote 2000, 2001. Um, and again, it's appropriate I'm here because almost everything I learned about obsessive thoughts were from patients I met at the OCD Institute. 
So the imp of the mind um, is specifically about these kind of intrusive thoughts. I had written a more general book called Getting Control about behavior therapy for OCD. Uh, but when we started the OCD Institute, have any of you actually toured it or, or been there or become a member of the Institute? So, if you, so you know that a lot of the program is group oriented programs. Um, and when we set up the program, we knew that we wanted to have exposure groups since that was a key part of treatment. So we knew there would be one and a half to two hours of exposure. Uh, but we also felt it was really important for people who had never talked about these thoughts before or their rituals before to talk with other people. Um, so several of the groups involved that. And in leading some of the groups, I realized that some people just didn't participate in the talks. And when I talked to those people or talked to their behavior therapists, the common thread were that they had these kind of chatting thoughts. Uh, so I, when we were still in the, the Hill Center, uh, started a group uh, just for people with these kind of tabby thoughts. And for the first time, these people start sharing the thoughts. Um, and that's where I learned most of what I know about these things of thoughts. And I think um, still to this day, the Inter Mind is, is the only book specifically about these kind of thoughts. So here is the main theory that I came up with. The Imp of the Mind will try to torment you with thoughts of whatever it is that you consider to be the most inappropriate or awful thing you could do. By the way, anybody know where the title of the input of the mind came from? Yes? Shakespeare? Shakespeare, no, close. <laughs> yeah? Edgar Allan Poe? Right. Uh, so Edgar Allan Poe has a short story called The Input of the Verse. And the idea is that for some reason human beings are wired to have urges to do something they shouldn't do, or to think about something they shouldn't do. And the more they tell themselves not to do something, the more they do it. So even though police tell you don't look back when there's an accident on the highway, and you tell yourself keep going, there's always backup to the highway to keep a rubber back and look back. Uh, even something so horrible you can to look at. Um, when I talked to the publisher about this, they said, you don't want to call it the imp of the perverts because nobody wants to carry a book up to the counter um, <laughs> with the word perverts. Now that would be a little bit Kindle today. People can buy all kinds of things they wouldn't buy from. So good part of that mind. But I want you to keep this definition in mind because I really find that this is helpful to my patients um, and to their family members as well. So the reason that particular thoughts are <coughs> picked out is because that is the most inappropriate or awful thing the person can do at that point in their life. And if any of you have these thoughts, and know people have these thoughts, you've probably seen that the thoughts can change over time. Sometimes people have sexual thoughts at one time in their life, maybe that they're, they're homosexual, they're not homosexual, or that they're straight if they're, if they're uh, homosexual, or um, thoughts about harming children, which may not come on until they have children, for example. So, it's the most inappropriate or thing you can do at that particular time. And here's an example. When I was a prosecutor, I sometimes felt a strong urge to have done at the policeman's ultimate. Terribly inappropriate to have to That's the end of the work. Maybe you think the worst thoughts at the most inappropriate times. Now that I'm in a different profession, I no longer have that particular bad thought. But occasionally another one enters my mind, which is just as appropriate. So would you agree that for uh, someone who is a prosecutor, that pulling a policeman's gun out of their holster at the courthouse uh, would be one of the most embarrassing things they could do at that time? Um, I, I used to see a patient who was a bodyguard um, and was an armed bodyguard for important people. Um, and I, think I won't be surprised to, rip, to, to hear that when that person was OCD, um, turned to all these kind of thoughts, they were that they would actually shoot the person they were guarding with the gun. Um, so obviously those would not be pleasant thoughts. And um, these people don't want to share these thoughts for the most part. So I want to give you an example to think about 
how distressing these thoughts can be. So this is from a adolescent who told his father that his brain is dead, that father's a bad dad, mom's a bad mom. They have recently been divorced. Um, that his brain said that he should hurt himself and hurt you and mom. And that his brain said that somebody's going to take him, kidnap him, and um, his brain said that he's dead. Also had other kind of thoughts about stabbing himself. The father said um, the son would talk to a therapist. Uh, they went week after week for thousands of dollars and really didn't improve. And the parents and the teachers were getting more and more concerned, as you can imagine. Um, so the first thing I wanted to, to show you is that these kind of intrusive thoughts are fairly common. There have been studies showing that college students, when they're being honest, will almost universally admit that they sometimes have violent or sexual thoughts or, or religious thoughts. So this is a group of depressed patients who study um, actually over 4,000 subjects in a very large depression study called uh, the STAR-D study. What's interesting about the STAR-D study was that one of the exclusion criteria was that the person couldn't have OCD. So these numbers are the obsessive thoughts that per people reported even after the doctors had screened out OCD. And you can see that uh, the second, the second category, 30 percent endorsed the idea that they would cause harm by something they forgot to do. Shut off a light switch, hit the run accident, something like that. And word that they speak or act violently when they really didn't want to. And the checking is often related to that. So in this group of depressed people who have been screened not to have OCD, more than half of them endorsed at least one OCD. And that's important as well because we think that depression itself leads people to have these more of these thoughts and the thoughts of seeing more real. <coughs> okay, here's another example. Um, OCD intrusive thoughts um, are known to be more common because now colleagues of ours have gone to work in various places and those who work in women's mental health are starting to ask pregnant or postpartum women about these thoughts. And they find that they're incredibly common. I'll leave you this one by yourself. So I think you'd agree as well that for this woman, having a new baby, the most taboo, upsetting, unacceptable thought she could have would be one. Farming her baby could also um, be sexually abusing the baby um, to the point where sometimes the mothers don't want to change baby's diapers. <coughs> What's important to realize is that they're having these thoughts because they hate the idea of thoughts so much. So the thoughts are the ones that they worry about because they'd be so, they, it would be so terrible they acted on them. The reason that they have the thoughts is because they think the thoughts are so awful that um, the idea that they can even think about them is right into them. So we'll talk more about that. Any questions so far? Okay. <coughs> so why do people develop these thoughts? One phenomenon I noticed in the patients I talked about, talked to, is that, you know, as you expect, the thoughts sometimes come when the person is doing really badly. But just as often the thoughts came when people were doing really well. When their lives had turned around, when they had a good relationship, they just got married, they just had kids, they just got a good job. And it happened enough that I, I really began to see a pattern. Anybody experience this or have a guess of why the thoughts might come more when things are going really well? Right. So 
title has to <laughs> but so when people feel like they have more to lose, they worry even more about doing something to ruin it. So if if a new mother has been waiting to have a child for years, uh, maybe had trouble getting pregnant, now has a child, she's responsible for taking care of the child. The OCD says, what can I torment her with? Uh, to make her think that she could do that would be so horrible that it would really upset her. Um, now, the biggest thing she has to lose is, is her baby. Um, you can imagine if it happens, um, the how a person would be ostracized by her husband, by her family, by in-laws, by the rest of society. So which OCD sufferers are most likely to suffer from these thoughts? Now we know that there are many, many different kinds of OCD symptoms. And as I said before, when we had the mixed groups at the OCD Institute, it was really strange to see that people who had contamination fears really couldn't relate to people who had intrusive thoughts, and people who had uh, checking rituals, if there was dust around, things like that, couldn't relate to other kinds. So there's many different kinds of, of OCD symptoms, and some often people have more than one type of symptom. We don't know the answer exactly why people develop particular kind of thoughts. Uh, but we have some ideas. So one major issue is all or nothing thinking. All or nothing thinking is pretty common in OCD and a lot of anxiety and depressive disorders, but it really reaches new dimensions with people with intrusive thoughts. So it's also known as black or white thinking perfectionism, and a new term now is intolerance of uncertainty. Uh, but they all really mean the same thing. A person just can't tolerate that they can't be 100% certain. They can't be 100% certain that they can never do these things. If you think about it, there's no way to disprove something that could happen in the future. So it is possible that the sun is not going to rise tomorrow. The odds are very low. Uh, but we can't disprove it because it has not been. So that really puts people with black or white thinking or all or nothing thinking in a bind. So here's the way all or nothing thinking works. Either things are horrible or they are perfect. And you can also see why this would lead to depression as well. Because most things in life are not 100% one way and 0% the other way. So when you're trying to make a decision between two things, where to live, what car to buy, where to send your kids to school, um, usually the decision comes down to 16% one way, 40% the other, 53, 43, 47. Uh, but for people with OCD in general, they try and check, maybe Google, Google uh, maybe ask for reassurance, trying to get this elusive 100%, and because they can never get there, they get more and more frustrated. So here's how it works for the intrusive thoughts. So for someone who has, for somebody who has intrusive thoughts, say of hurting their vulnerable baby, Even if the thoughts don't occur 99% of the time, that's not acceptable to them. Only 100% is acceptable. So even if the thoughts um, occur one tenth of a percent of the time, that's still not acceptable. And because of that, they beat themselves up and try and get that. Certain, even though it's impossible. And you know, we we try and do exposure therapy and response prevention with these patients. But before that, we do what's called psychoeducation, try and explain why people have these thoughts. And in this case, it really turns to philosophical ideas. Um, you know, how do we go on each day knowing that we might not survive that day. Okay. Or 
that every time we get in a car, we could have an accident, or every time we send our kid off to school, they could be kidnapped. So we all know that the odds are not zero of those things happening. They make the news certainly, you know, we can't reduce it. But somehow, if we don't have these kind of thoughts, we're able to accept that that is small amount of doubt. But when we stop and think about it, we realize that there's always these chances. So life involves uncertainty. If you cannot accept the idea that there's uncertainty, you're going to have a problem because it doesn't match up with reality. The other thing that I found a pattern with patients that I saw was that they tended to be very sensitive people. Has anybody seen this book? How many sensitive person? You've seen it before. So this book um, was a, a bestseller a while back. And the psychologist, Aaron, who wrote it, um, is a highly sensitive person herself. And the term is kind of vague, uh, but in general, it describes people who are very sensitive to their environment, very sensitive to what other people think about them, um, maybe very sensitive to loud noises, things like that. Some of it overlaps with being introverted, some of it overlaps with being um, easily um, aroused by stimuli. Um, and as I started to have more and more people come through my bad thoughts group, which is what we called it, I would ask them some of these questions, and, and without exception, people were saying, yes, you know, I was very imaginative as a child, I had good, good uh, imagination skills, um, I like to listen to music, um, I really get upset if somebody thinks badly of me, it's called uh, interpersonal sensitivity. So when you think of those kind of thoughts, those kind of characteristics, they really give the implication something to work on. Because if you have very strong imagery, and say you watch a movie or watch a news story about some horrible crime, and those images stick in your mind, and then you start thinking, how can I be certain they're not true? We know that they're taboo thoughts already. But in addition, these people are extra sensitive to other people rejecting them. So as a result, they will keep it to themselves, not tell boyfriend, girlfriend, parents, spouse for decades about these kind of thoughts um, because they're worried how that person will react. So if, if you do feel like you're a highly sensitive person, this is a really helpful book to read, uh, particularly the chapter for the person living with a highly sensitive person, um, helping the person understand um, what are the needs of a highly sensitive person. People who are highly sensitive often need to take a break from too much stimulation. They need to be alone for a while. Um, and if they're uh, married or involved with someone else who is, say, more extroverted, likes all the partying and, and stimulation, um, they might not know how to relate to that. So there are plenty of these kind of movies out there. And there are many people who have intrusive thoughts who will do anything they can not to see these kind of movies because the thoughts might stick in their mind. Anybody here not like to watch horror movies in a book setting? <laughs> so, the, it doesn't mean you have OCD. It probably means you are sensitive to these things. Um, and I've had a lot of patients who just can't watch the news anymore because the news seeks out these horrible stories they talk about. And if nothing else, I tell people try not to watch the news before going to sleep at night. Uh, because the imp of the mind tends to you know, like that vulnerable, vulnerable time when you're lying in bed at night with nothing to occupy your mind, um, no distractions, and that's when these images, the thoughts, tend to come back. So here's uh, one of the many quotes I found online about violent movies. So this is another piece of being sensitive. Um, part of it, I think, is being overly empathetic. 
feeling other people's pain too much, if it's possible to feel too much. Um, hating stories about animals being hurt. You know those, those commercials about the dogs and cats being mistreated? Um, people are really sensitive to not be able to watch that and just you know, have nightmares feel terribly about those kind of, about those kind of thoughts. And just to show you that these are not particular people with OCD. A lot of people don't like certain films, sexual scenes, violent scenes, um, because they get caught up in their mind. So this person said it makes them feel traumatized. So people who are extra sensitive um, tend to have good visual memories, tend to react to things really strongly, tend to be very empathetic. If they have experienced some kind of trauma in the past, they may well develop this fear of intrusive thoughts. So a minority of people with intrusive thoughts you know, remember some specific traumatic situation. It could be something not involving their personal life, like witnessing a terrible accident or a battlefield violence, um, or uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse. And then those thoughts keep playing over in your mind, and the person make up uh, angry, violent thoughts that you find on Yes? Just thinking, uh, I have a seven-year-old son who is, he started off feeling like he was too much by the Darth Maul from Star Wars, which and he has OCD. So we talked about it, I'm like, well, that's, a, that's an understandable fear. He is a creepy character. I'm afraid of him, although he's not real. But we assure him that he's just a fictional character. We watch videos of him on the media. Um, but now he's at the point where he's made it his mission to, like, <laughs> but he doesn't relate to him, but he's like, I'm being brought to school. So it's almost like he's Um, I can't say it's healthy or not, but I think it probably does. Um, we often see people who are you know, afraid of heights become pilots, and, you know, afraid of blood movements, you know, become surgeons. Um, I think it's, it doesn't seem like it hurts. Um, the most important I think, thing with him, though, I think, is that it keeps him going back and seeing it, not avoiding it, that eventually those things won't bother him as much. I mean, if, if you see any problems, they're going to pop up. You know, he starts not sleeping at night because of night manners or whatever. But um, you know, he's coming out with a different, more positive perspective trying to master the situation. Sure. Yes? I also have a question. I have a son who's 18, and this doesn't map out to his personality. He actually seeks out very violent movies, and I'm always concerned about that. So. I don't know how to understand what you're saying with that, because he actually seeks out movies like that. Well, obviously it's not going to match everybody. Um, I can tell you, though, that sometimes people with these kind of thoughts um, will put themselves in situations to check themselves out. So I don't know if that's his case, um, but I've had people with who have worries about using knives who will actually pick up a knife and hold it against their skin to test themselves to make sure they won't do it. Uh, or people who are worried about being attracted to the same sex or the opposite sex who will look at magazines and then check their body to see if they're aroused or not. So it, it just may be he doesn't match his profile. It is also possible that he's testing himself in some way to see you know, what happens with those triggers. Okay, thank you. Uh, but teenagers are usually are very, very shy to say, uh, very uh, slow to share anything with their their parents, uh, but you can imagine how much more they still need to share these kind of thoughts, especially you know, if their thoughts about harming somebody in the family or incestuous thoughts, um, that they can go years and years and years. Thank you. Okay, so what are the effective treatments? So I already mentioned that psychoeducation is the first thing that we always do, and I'm sure you're familiar with this. This is you know, when the behavior therapist or the psychiatrist sits down and explains, you know, this is OCD, you're not going crazy, this is why we think people have OCD, um, avoidance is bad, 
um, trying to resist the thoughts are bad. Just trying to explain as much as we can about what the thoughts are and what the rituals are and how to deal with them. And for some people, psychoeducation alone is enough. Um, once they understand that they're not supposed to avoid these situations and that they aren't a terrible person because of these thoughts, in milder cases, they're able to take the ball and just run with that. And I've gotten emails to people who read my book and I have, have even worked alone or with therapists and gotten the thoughts of the pain. I should say here, though, that the, the thoughts don't go away completely. That's not a realistic goal. I wish that was true, uh, but it's important for people raw enough to think to realize that. Right? Because if you go without having these thoughts for a very long time, and then you get triggered by some new situation and have thoughts, it's very easy to think, I failed, I'm all the way back to the beginning. You know, I'm, I, or even worse, it was no CD in the first place. I really do want to kill somebody. So psychoeducation is, is very important. And if there's one place that it is helpful to see a specialist with OCD, I think it's in psychoeducation. And we know from studies that people who are graduate students who are your bachelor's um, degree, people who are uh, using a manual can get good results, especially with exposure response prevention. But there's nothing like talking to someone who's seen hundreds of thousands of patients with a particular problem to say, I've seen this before, here's what it is, here's what's going to happen. And unfortunately, in Boston, you have a lot of experts. We can see it's you know, very sad when we hear from people in parts of the United States where there's no one who treats OCD, uh, or people in parts of the world where they're afraid that they will be imprisoned um, or killed if they get to have some of these thoughts. So cognitive therapy, which I describe in the book as well, is a newer treatment, um, and it focuses on the thoughts themselves, teaching people the principles of um, how to get thoughts under control, uh, but paradoxically, how to get them under control by not trying to control them. Uh, you've probably heard about some of these techniques, some mindfulness techniques, um, some distraction techniques, um, and part of that is psychoeducation, reframing what the situation is, labeling this as OCD. Exposure therapy, response prevention, again, is the cornerstone treatment for non-drug treatments. Um, and for someone who is afraid of knives, for example, exposure might involve having them handle knives. I have a very little pocket knife on a uh, Swiss Army knife pocket knife about this big, like you might keep chain. That might be the first exposure I'll do in an office, in an office setting. Uh, some people just try to go to the kitchen, one of the drawers. Uh, to teach them not to avoid those situations and also not to do rituals afterwards. So if they're in that situation, I tell them that it's very likely they're going to have thoughts triggered or images triggered. This association's been there for a while. And the urge is going to be to do something to undo that feeling, but that they have to try and resist doing that. Um, and if the person can't, put it off, or can't keep from doing it for a full two hours, even having them start out by delaying it is helpful. So if you, do you think you delay it for a half an hour before doing it? Most of the time, after the half hour is up, the urge to do it has gone away. And medication uh, can be an effective treatment for these, for these thoughts as well. And it's exactly the same kind of um, medication as the SSRI drugs, the newer medications that also affect uh, glutamate or, uh, or yeah, as well as uh, serotonin or as well. So part of the cognitive therapy, let me answer the question first. <coughs> Psychoeducation is, psychoeducation is done for all different kinds of treatments. So it's explaining to the person why they have the problem, what we know about it, what we know about what makes it better, and what they can expect in the future. And that is really, really important because the treatments are difficult to do. There's no getting around it. 
and the person has to trust you and also be motivated to make these changes. Right? If they really don't believe that this is going to work for them, if they really believe only medication can work or nothing's going to work for them, you know, it, it, it's not going to help to rush in to do exposure therapy until they're convinced that it's not going to work and then they worry about themselves. So psychoeducation is just explaining um, about the disorder. And in most cases, what I'll do is, is have people read various books. Um, because it's much easier to have them go home and spend 10 hours reading a book rather than to be 10 sessions. So they can read my book, they can read talk about another book called My Bears. Um, that's really helpful. So psychoeducation you know, can act like a kind of cognitive therapy that changes a person's thinking. But it's not, that's not the real purpose. The purpose is to educate the person, have them label the problem as OCD, or <coughs> if it's for depression, or if it's for substance abuse, help them understand what is going on, what we know about, what the treatments are, what we expect. Okay, so part of cognitive <coughs> therapy is to explain the latest research and how we learn thoughts and other thoughts. So one important thing to keep in mind is the more you try and check, to check and reassure yourself that you can never act on these thoughts, the more uncertain you become. Uh, so when I started, when we started these groups that I complained, uh, the checking had to do with asking for reassurance, <coughs> um, asking family members for reassurance, going to the library and reading about these problems. What do you think is the number one source of checking today in 2015? Internet. Right. Internet has this to be Googling. Right. Googling is a good thing, um, but for <laughs> someone who has OCD, it's a real problem because it's always there. And you can find a minority opinion about almost anything. Right. That medication is great and medications are hard. OCD is horrible. Um, all you have is OCD, you need to do therapy, or you're really possessed by the devil, what you need to do is be exercise. All you have to do is just look around enough and find what's going on. You see people who you know, stay up all night searching on Google to try and get reassurance. So one of the first things I try to do is have them swear off Google, that they don't check their, their email and their Facebook, uh, but not Google for reassurance. Okay, so here's one of the, the books. Well, the psychoeducation through reading bibliotherapy. Okay, and if you read White Bears and Other Unwanted Thoughts, really good book. Um, Dr. Wagner is a psychologist who uh, started his research when he was in Virginia. Now he works um, at Harvard College. Uh, he's collaborated with us on some studies. And what he's known for is experimental research in thought suppression. Have you all heard about thought suppression? All right, since you haven't heard about thought suppression, let's do a quick experiment, okay? Okay, I want you all to close your eyes, if you can. And for the next minute, I want you to do everything possible not to think about a white bear, okay? Keep your eyes closed, go. Remember, whatever you do, don't think about a white bear. somebody not to think of a thought. The thought is likely to break through. And when they stop thinking about the thought, there's even a rebound effect. So that white bear thoughts come to their mind more. The other thing he found, though, is that it's especially true for emotional kind of thoughts. So white bear is pretty um, non... We don't really deal with white bears very much. 
but when you had students think about things that were really important to them, like something happened to a family member or to a loved one, another loved one, uh, that those thoughts get really uh, increased when you try to suppress them. So when you think about the kind of thoughts we're talking about here, they certainly have a lot of emotional content. So the more somebody tries to suppress these thoughts, the more they bounce back. And you can see, for example, with the blasphemous thoughts, if someone comes to a very religious upbringing and they're taught, taught over and over, you can't have these thoughts, thinking something is, is, is just as sinful as doing it. You have to make sure you don't do these kind of things. And for somebody who's very sensitive, that the thoughts might come from suppressing those thoughts. Um, telling a, a teenager that they're not supposed to think about sex or that the sin you know, may lead them to do thought suppression and have a rebound effect. And then they're right, why am I thinking more than I was before? It's a devil making me do this. So this is where the title came from. Uh, Dostoevsky, one of his short stories, said, try to pose for yourself this task, not to think of a polar bear, and you'll see that the cursed thing will come to mind every minute. <laughs> so the story, whether it's true or not, is that when he was a child, Dostoevsky's son, Sibley, uh, told him to stand in a corner and until you cannot think about a white bear for five minutes. Um, so he ended up standing in the corner for hours and hours because the white bear kept coming up. Okay, so we've recently started a uh, website called OSPFamilies.org and we're trying to focus on these kind of thoughts because there isn't a lot out there on the internet for this kind of thoughts. And one thing that we found that people really like is the idea of talking to somebody who has already been through this kind of treatment before. Uh, people have these thoughts, like I said, as a rule, don't like to share these kind of thoughts. They're very nervous. Uh, but it does help them feel less alone. So if this works, I'm going to try and play a little clip of a phone conversation between a person who's getting started with treatment for these thoughts and somebody who's already been through treatment is doing well with these kind of thoughts. Mm -hmm. But when I was a kid, I didn't know what it was, and I pretty much thought that I was going crazy. But then, you know, something was seriously wrong with me. Like she had sexual thoughts sick. about her baby after like, mm -hmm. baby's sick. birth. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I was basically just going through a really hard time and then someone in the hospital said to me, did you know you have OCD? And I said, no, I never heard of it. I, you know, which is weird because I'm a Googler and I Google everything, but mm -hmm. I was actually nervous just to want to talk to you. <laughs> I had OCD pretty much my whole life, but it didn't start getting bad until my son was about 20 months old, and he's almost, no, he just turned three, so it's been, it's been a year and a half or so, but yeah, that's when I really kind of knew, you know, that it was, once you do that it was bad, you know. I don't know, because I had depression too, so it's probably all related somehow, mm -hmm. I think. But, um, and does it, does it, the OCD still like flare up somehow? Sometimes I do, yes, I do have, you know, thoughts of basically my whole thing was I was afraid that I was going to sexually molest my son. Mm -hmm. So I have fears, um, and we you all know, closely, so like my time was the worst in that time, but I, you know, still think, and I get, you know, if I'm really close to my son, and if I'm giving him hug or something, I'm like, Oh my goodness, did I just feel like I just got turned on? But I don't know that it's just because it's like habit for me to think that way because I've been thinking that way for, you know, so long, but then mm -hmm. it's not like it was before. Like before I would like stop right like there, panic, not want to touch my son, not even give him a hug, I wouldn't even really want to give him a kiss. You know, I just thought like the way I was hugging would be inappropriate. So it's, it's not, it's definitely gotten much better since that. I'll stop there. So, you heard that, first of all, you heard that she Googled a lot to try to reassure herself, and that the thoughts didn't turn to these kind of thoughts until 
when her first child was 20 months old. At that time, she said she started to think about all the bad things that could happen, how am I going to leave him with a babysitter, what if somebody molests him at daycare, and then she said, oh, what if, what if I do that myself? Um, so she got to the point where she would have her husband uh, diaper the baby. Um, she avoided breastfeeding the baby because she didn't want any positive feelings around him that she might have turned as sexual. And when she got pregnant the second time when I met her, um, she had um, been very close to committing suicide. Um, these thoughts are really have the closest connection to suicidal thoughts, of any OCD thoughts. We just finished a analyzing survey of college students, um, and many college students have these kind of intrusive thoughts. And these are thoughts with the highest correlation with depression and also suicide. Um, and the idea is because they really attack a person's sense of themselves. And here's one of the first literary descriptions of this idea. I heard that one story of the good Dr. Jekyll and the bad Mr. Hyde. And Dr. Jekyll is a wonderful uh, doctor, well-respected in London, develops this new concoction that when he drinks it, Mr. Hyde comes out and does all kinds of terrible things. Uh, Stevenson never says the terrible things that he does, but implies that they're violent or sexual kinds of things. The woman you heard, actually two of you here, you heard on that, would think that this is what's going on, that they've been pretending to the world that they're a nice person all these years, but there's really a Mr. Hyde that's ready to come out. So that's why labeling things is so important. That is, the OCD is trying to make them think about these thoughts because those things are so hard all the time. Because the thing that they dislike the most in the world is people who molest children, et cetera, et cetera. Any questions on this? OK. Last slide. Happy ending is that the, the boy did really well with just a couple of sessions of psychoeducation um, and psychoeducation of his father about how to deal with requests for reassurance. And his father gave me this quote, the most important message the parents who are children have suffered from face in the face of intrusive thoughts is to recognize this is a distinct anxiety disorder requires a certain type of therapy. I'm very thankful that my sons in the face of thoughts are much less frequent now. When they do pop up, he's better prepared to deal with them. So, if you remember, this was a child whose counsel was very worried. Um, teachers were very worried that he actually would end up killing his parents or killing um, Someone in school or killing himself because he had thoughts of that. Uh, images about hurting himself for the night as well. Um, so there's a fine line to walk between reassuring someone and having them accept a little bit of uncertainty. Um, this boy, um, not him, this is just a random boy, but the boy um, whose father I talked to him as well, um, you know, showed no signs of making never engaged in aggressive behaviors. This all happened after the time of the parents' divorce. Um, he had some angry feelings at both parents, the boyfriend and girlfriends that they had, um, didn't like sleeping alone in the room anymore. It was clearly an anxiety problem with him. And he'd been very sensitive since he was a little kid. Had a separation anxiety as a little kid. Didn't like going away to sleepovers, didn't like do things, to go out used to things. So you know, trying to explain that you know, this is partly personality you can inform it. And there are very many good parts to that personality. It makes you very, um, very empathetic. You don't want to help other people. A creative, deep thinker. But when your mind is idle, a very active mind, if it's idle, it can go to these negative thoughts. And if you let it go there, it's going to try and pick out these things that are most horrible for you. Okay. Um, time for some questions before breaking up for the group. Yeah. Um, if, have you ever heard of anyone actually acting on their, their feelings, though? Have I ever heard of anybody actually acting on their Someone feelings? with OCD. Someone with OCD. Um, well, first of all, people do act on these, people do commit these actions. Um, 
what do I worry about, right? If, you know, if no mothers ever kill their babies, if, if no one ever sexually abused children, uh, no one would worry about it. Uh, but the people who do that don't have the CD and they have uh, you know, certain predictors before. Um, there's one person who I had in all honesty who did act on his thoughts. Um, somebody who had intrusive thoughts about grabbing a gun and one night got very, very drunk and got very, very anxious and acted on it and ended up going to jail in Pittsburgh and coming here to the Coast of the Institute. And you know, we had to be very clear with him that um, <laughs> drinking too much uh, is disinhibiting. And that's why people drink, because it helps relieve them of their you know, daily worries. But if a person drinks too much, people do things um, and don't remember what they did. So we told him that you know, he absolutely had to have treatment for his drinking problem, and that we wouldn't support him you know, being in, in a situation that triggered him until he proves that he can't drink in those situations. So he's the only one, um, you know, for the most part, people with OCD don't like drinking. Um, one thing, when they drink too much and they can't remember what happened, it really amps up their anxiety because they think of all the things that could have happened. Um, but, you know, in full disclosure, he was the one person. Uh, but it was a very specific situation and, you know, all the other hundreds and thousands of people have it. Thank you. Sure. We'll have a couple more. Anybody have any questions? Sure. Okay, great. Well, thanks for coming. Enjoy the support group. Thank you.